in some ways quite straightforward. If you um, work with an adult patient, say someone is 35 presenting for treatment, 90% um, of the time that person, if, if he or she is 35, uh, would have been ill for at least 15 if not 20 years because anorexia nervosa almost always onsets in mid-teens. So here's someone who's 35, uh, she's been unwell for a good two decades. Um, and I just mentioned earlier that there are no treatment studies that would guide us in terms of what would be a good treatment approach for this particular patient population or for this particular individual. So a lot of that would be improvising and, and uh, uh, you know, putting a treatment package together on a case-by-case -case basis that is mostly driven, driven by clinician intuition rather than uh, hard data. Um, so that, that's the first major stumbling block when you treat an adult patient with an eating disorder. The second major stumbling block is that um, I also mentioned earlier that most of our patients are highly ambivalent about uh, seeking out treatment. Uh, and here's someone who's been ill for 20 years, probably has been in treatment before uh, and has become quite treatment resistant and probably presents to your, your office for treatment in part because they've been coerced by a family member, by a friend, a spouse or a partner. Uh, it's, it's very infrequently that that person very willingly arrives at your door and goes, I need treatment, I need it now, uh, let's get going. Uh, it just, that just doesn't happen. Um, so you, you constantly have to figure out, so what am I doing here? And you're doing it in an atmosphere where if you were to, say, push weight gain, which is inevitable because you cannot recover without weight gain if you have anorexia, you might very well push the patient out the door because they get so frightened by the, the prospect. So it's that delicate balance between how you maintain this person in, tr in treatment and how do you push not too much in the area of weight gain. Uh, so you can see sort of a tap dance to, to move the process forward and, and, and the outcomes are usually pretty guarded uh, at, at, at best. Um, but when it comes to adolescents, they are equally ambivalent, uh, if not downright unwilling to engage in treatment. But uh, as you can imagine, the 35-year-old versus the 15-year-old, the 15-year-old has been ill for a couple of months. And it's, it's almost always a little easier to intervene uh, with someone who's, who hasn't been ill that long. Uh, secondly, uh, that 15-year-old will probably be just as ambivalent or unwilling to engage in treatment as the 35-year-old, but whereas the 35-year-old has to arrive on her own accord um, and will really have to, to pluck up all the courage to get herself to, the, to your office, the 15-year-old is driven here by her parents. So in the treatment, and especially in family-based treatment, you are appealing to the parents to make the intervention. Uh, in other words, to help restore the adolescent's weight and, and put them back on track with adolescent development. Um, and by the time the parents have succeeded in that task, the way in which the adolescent is thinking about herself and, and, and her illness uh, really has changed because a lot of those thoughts and feelings about not wanting to engage in treatment and being very ambivalent uh, are the side effects of starvation. And so if you get the parents to reverse the starvation, then you actually have someone that you can talk to relatively soon in treatment. Uh, and you still have the parents who are the ones who have the leverage in terms of keeping that person in treatment. And you have a treatment that actually has proven efficacy. Uh, so altogether, that, that package is a little easier to manage, if you like, in adolescents than would be the case in adults. Uh, how about research into what causes an eating disorder or what doesn't cause an eating disorder as it may be? That's a quick and easy one. Yeah. Um, we don't know um, and it sounds like a cop-out uh, for a very good question but um, we really just do not know what the causes of eating disorders are. I, we certainly speculate and we speculate along the lines of um, in, uh, genetics, environment, uh, personality, uh, biological makeup, uh, and life events, to name but a few. So those probably would be some of the main areas in which there are uh, folks in, in, in my field who would be uh, endeavoring to get to the bottom of that question. Um, there's been a lot of investment in the last decade uh, into the genetics of anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, and I think across a number of studies now, uh, 
my colleagues would argue that the heritability is, uh, the chances of, of an individual developing an eating disorder if there's a member of the close family with an eating disorder is about 50%. Uh, and so everyone recognizes that genes play a role, but the extent to which, uh, which uh, constellation of, of genes, I think that's way down, down the road. Um, but I always like to think of, of uh, in answering that question, is uh, to develop an eating disorder is like a very complex or complicated recipe to bake a cake. No pun intended to use a food analogy, but uh, if you can think of a very detailed, complex uh, recipe and certain things, the ingredients have to be entered in a certain order at a specific time in order for that product to be uh, the cake that you, that you had in mind or that the recipe has in mind. I think it's very much the same for an eating disorder, that a number of things have to happen in a specific order in a specific individual for that, for anorexia, for instance, to be, to develop. Millions of young women died every day, but only a fraction of them become, uh, or develop anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. So it has to be dieting plus a, a host of other uh, factors. And I think uh, it's a long way off before we'd be able to say with any degree of certainty what's underlying but specifically is uh, at the heart of this disorder.